school visit. Perfect, there we go. Um, so for a $10 donation, um, supplies for one school visit, uh, supports digital data collection for one month, and meals for one day during field work. It's quite a bit for $10, $25, one conflict mitigation toolbox, or one student workbook, or spay and neuter for a community cat and dog. And then for a $50 donation, one day of national survey field work, one week of dog training, and one week of camera trapping. Um, and then obviously you can choose any amount you would like if you so choose to donate this evening, um, but any donations would be greatly appreciated. Um, all right, so let's go on to our next slide, see what we got. There you go. So that's a, uh, the, our Venmo. So you can, you should be able to take a picture of your screen right now and that'll connect you to our Venmo account. Um, or it's just at call dash action for cheetahs. Um, so you can donate anytime you would like, or if you want to hold on to this and uh, for the future dates, you can as well. Um, again, any donation is appreciated. And there are some fun cheetahs below. I believe is the bottom right one. Is that is that at the San Diego Zoo? Yeah, I think that's Jabula, my Aww. baby boy. Nice. So we'll keep this up for just a moment, give you guys time to grab your phones. <laughs> and we'll go ahead and do another cheer since this is social hour. <laughs> Thank you for the chuckle. And don't forget for everyone to put it on speaker view if you can. It will be easier to see who's going to be talking next. Yes, if you if you want to see my face, speaker view. <laughs> um, we will start in just another minute with our first presenter. Um, was this our last slide, Sonora? Uh, yeah, I do. I believe so. Perfect. And we will bring these slides up after each presenter. We'll have a moment for um, Q&A and, um, and then we'll kind of go through these slides again if you wanted a little reminder of what your dollar can do um, out in the field in Kenya. And then we'll put this Venmo page back up as well. So if you miss this opportunity, you will have a couple more throughout this event and it will last approximately two hours. Um, so yeah. All righty. So I'm going to go ahead and um, hand it off to Jess. She is uh, my partner that helps me quite a bit with um, fundraising and um, different outreach responsibilities here in the US. She's also from Southern California. So Luckily, sometimes we can meet in person and it's not all on Zoom, uh, but she's going to go ahead and um, and present our first speaker. All right, guys. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, our first speaker of this series to lead us off is going to be none other than our founder and director, Mary Wickstra. Um, she is uh, on the Zoom with us at, right now, and it is early, early in the morning in Kenya, and we appreciate her joining us. Um, I am not going to give a short bio on her because I'm going to let her do that. She knows more about herself than I definitely can tell. So um, we're looking forward to hearing from her, and thank you so much for starting us off. Go ahead, Mary. Great. Thank you. Um, so I've been based in Kenya now for nearly 20 years. And prior to that, I got my start in the career um, through zoos. I was a zookeeper in Michigan and then got into exhibit design, but I'm gonna talk about that more in my presentation. I've titled my presentation, I Learned to Drink Tea. And the reason that I titled it that is because when I first came to Kenya, I really, really did not like tea but tea is a big part of the Kenyan culture. And when I first kind of started, 
I would say no thank you to the tea, but I started to see the disappointment in people's faces when I would say no thank you because it is so ingrained and, and people seem to think that, you know, oh, you're not good enough to drink my tea. And, I, and if I ever told anybody I didn't like tea, then, you know, they would give me this, this additional shocked look. Um, so I basically kind of taught myself to like tea. And in the end, I, I really do like the milk and sugar part of tea, but I still really have to go and gulp down um, the, the, the tea itself if it's plain tea. Um, so Sonora, I think that you have a copy of a pre-recorded presentation. Being in Kenya, I um, am afraid that my internet kind of comes and goes. And so with that little bit of introduction, I think the rest of the, the personal details is in that presentation. The rest of the personal details is in that presentation. That one broke up. I didn't actually hear what you said. <laughs> Um, Sonar, do you want to go ahead and play it? Are you able to do that? Um, I, I, don't from have, my I don't have it queued up right here. I could get it. Um, or if you have it ready, then um, you're free to share also. Okay. Um, let me do share screen then. Um, I got to get back into the right place. Uh, da, 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 da. I can't find share screen, there it is. It says host disabled the share screen, so you're gonna have to let me share. Mm -hmm. All right, I think you can, there we go. All right, let's give this a try then. Hi everyone, my name is Mary Weikstra. Is there sound? And I'm the director yep. of Action Cheetahs in Kenya. First of all, I want to thank everyone for attending today. And thank you so much to Jessica, Jess, and Sonora for putting this workshop together. I'd like to share with you my journey in the field of conservation. Along the way, there were a lot of choices that I made that I am proud of. And there are other choices that I wish I would have done different or better. But altogether, the choices have been a part of the journey that makes me who I am and makes Action for Cheetahs in Kenya the project that it is today as well. I will share with you the journey from a little farm girl. I was born the last of 10 children in a community in, a, in the state of Michigan in the USA to now being a director of, conser of a conservation organization in East Africa. I was lucky that I had a strong base of support from my parents who encouraged me to follow my dreams and to work hard by setting realistic goals for myself. When people ask me for my key tip in achieving success, the first thing that comes to my mind is to set goals that have achievable steps. If you try to make a leap that is too large, it becomes overwhelming and depressing. I have found myself there on many occasions where I've needed to take a step backwards and to reevaluate the goals that establish the steps to get to where I want to be in a way that is achievable. My early education was in a very small school system. My elementary school class had 11 children and my high school had only 97. My parents could not fund college and my grades were not good enough to get an academic scholarship. So my undergraduate studies were funded through loans and by working two or three jobs on weekends, after classes, and in the summertime. My first job in working with animals were at, as a veterinary technician in between university semesters. Some of them were voluntary or they were very low pay positions where promotions enabled me to move into better pay over time. My first full-time job was after graduation as a zookeeper in Michigan. I later moved to Utah where zookeeper positions were not open and I stood actually in the food service department to get my foot in the door. But I had a chance to a volunteer. After several months, a position opened in the exhibit design department, where I soon realized that I could use my animal behavior skills and background from university and my love for working on my hands to improve not only the lives of the animals at the zoo, but also to educate and raise awareness for animals in the wild. 
When I was seven years old, I told my father that I wanted to work in Africa. It was only in my 20s when I was helping to raise funds for rhinos in Kenya that I finally had the, my first chance to visit the continent that I had dreamed about for so many years. I took a loan to make that first trip. And the second trip I won through being a top fundraiser with the American Association of Zookeepers Bowling for Rhinos. We supported Lewa Wildlife Conservancy, which I visited on both of those trips. I never felt so much at home as I did on those trips. A friend and I began planning a way that we could make our own work with, with field conservation projects. And I wrote several grant proposals for funding after being accepted for a three month position in Madagascar. At Park Ivaloina, Kayla and I held a series of meetings with staff and managers at a small lemur rehabilitation and sanctuary facility. We observed the lemur's behaviors and evaluated the education components of the Park Ivaloina facility. In two months, we renovated over half the enclosures to assure that lemurs had elements of their natural niche, which is canopy, mid-story, or ground dwelling, and we greatly improved the well-being of the lemurs that could not be released back into the wild. At the same time that we were accepted for the position in Madagascar, we also received acceptance to volunteer at the Cheetah Conservation Fund in Namibia. And I raised the funds to be able to accept both volunteer positions. In between projects, we took a small vacation to backpack in Kenya, and then we headed south to work in Namibia. It was there that I realized that saving cheetahs was so much more than research and the importance of community involvement in conservation. We spent six months designing and writing graphics to construct the education center at CCF, which culminated with a grand opening just a few days before we returned to the U.S. and back to our normal lives. But I could not get Africa, cheetahs, and a statement made by Dr. Marker out of my head. What do you really want to do, she asked. I really wanted to make a difference. I think my exhibit design position was making a difference in the perception that visitors had of animals and the need to support conservation in the wild. But I also felt a pull to be one of the people who made a difference on the ground. I submitted a proposal to go back to Namibia, but not to remain there. I wanted to go to Kenya where I knew that cheetahs really needed help. So in my second trip to Namibia, I was focused on understanding the research and the outreach models of CCF and also visited the Cheetah Outreach Center in South Africa. I submitted a proposal to the Kenya Wildlife Service and selected an area of Kenya where there was a large decline in order to better understand the threats to cheetahs and what efforts were needed to support their conservation locally. My question was, could Southern African models be applied to cheetah conservation in East Africa? While Namibia is the country that holds the largest population of cheetahs, Kenya holds the second largest and is central to the Eastern African population. East Africa is the largest area of connected cheetah population. Yet prior to our work and that of others that are working in collaboration through national cheetah strategies, little was known about the rate of their decline or the threats and solutions needed for their survival. From December 2001 until 2008, I worked under CCF as the Kenya Project Coordinator. We worked in affiliation with the Kenya Wildlife Service and developed partnerships with other conservation organizations locally and regionally. CCF provided support and guidance in the project's methodology. Kenya Wildlife Service provided technical and logistical support, guidance, and connection with other carnivore projects. For the first three years, we worked mostly in private conservancies while reaching out to community groups to slowly integrate the research into areas where there was a huge gap in knowledge and many cultural differences. Those cultural differences were not only for me as a foreigner, but even Cosmos, who came from the Akamba community. Luckily, both of us are quite friendly and outgoing in our approach, and we found communities throughout the Cheetah Range to be very welcoming. We also soon realized that the idea of reintroduction of cheetahs into an area where they had essentially been extirpated would not be feasible. The next phase of our research took us into some of the most remote regions of Kenya. Previously, studies used interviews and assumptions to make an estimate of cheetah numbers. In our project, we conducted field surveys and interviews across the entire cheetah range between 2004 and 2007. Throughout our work, we involved both local and international students, volunteers, and conducted outreach activities. 
Between 2007 and 2011, both Cosmos and I completed our master's degrees, enabling us to provide better guidance to incoming students and to solidify affiliations with the University of Nairobi in Kenya and with Colorado State University in the US. Since 2003, two Kenyan PhD projects, nine international and five Kenyan master's projects, five international and three Kenyan master's scholarships, eight international and five Kenyan internships for um, general internships, one international Bachelor of Science thesis, and two other Kenyan non-academic internships. That's a total of 40 students in 20 years. The results of our National Cheetah Survey directed the focus of our work for 10 years. We managed two field sites and tested methods of invasive using radio collars and non-invasive research using game counts, tracking, and developing the SCAT detection dog program. This was all to paint a better picture of the overall status of cheetahs in Kenya. To give the full picture of the scope of our work, this is a map of the cheetah distribution and the areas of our focus are highlighted in blue. Areas that are circled and starred are areas of consultation and short-term work with conservation partners. For those who may not be familiar with the Action for Cheetahs in Kenya work, we are a research-focused project that is involved in supporting wildlife conservation on community land. Our current field operations are based in northern Kenya in the Maybai Community Conservancy, where we focus on the interaction between cheetahs and people. This project is now 20 years old, and its success is because of a passionate team that works together to assure we conduct sound science and apply results to community actions. While our pilot projects focus in Samburu, we also evaluate the cheetah status on a range-wide scale. The national survey team consists of scientists and the SCAT dog program. PhD student Noreen Matoro and assistant director Cosmos Wambua lead the team while our education and outreach coordinator Adelaide Moturi develops the materials and programs to share results in schools, with communities, and with colleagues. Because of our strong focus on community, other projects include linear ecology, conflict mitigation, and one health through vaccination and sterilization of domestic animals. We improve the relationships between people's livelihoods and wildlife. In addition to the Cheetah's book that was published in 2018, we've completed four additional publications in the past few years to share our work with the professional and conservation realm. My key takeaway is that it takes a dedicated team and strong partnerships to make conservation work. Thank you. So yeah, I hope that came through clearly. Um, and I think I stuck pretty close to my 10 minutes. Um, so Jessica, if you want to um, see if there's any questions now, or do you want to save questions for the end, um, you can take it over. Um, yeah, we don't have any questions so far in the chat. Oh, wait, we, oh, that's me. <laughs> Um, I had a question. What is the biggest challenge you faced when starting your work in Kenya? I mean, I think I think the biggest challenge that I faced was coming in as a as a bit of an outsider, um, as a foreigner, and, and trying to make the right connections. And and that is kind of the reason why we formed Carnivores Livelihoods and Landscapes was also because of those challenges that I faced, we wanted to be able to help, um, whether you're a foreigner or you're a Kenyan, we wanted to be able to help people make connections um, to the Kenya Wildlife Service, to other carnivore organizations, and to be able to give advice on infrastructure development. Um, so that was, um, that was, I guess I overcame that. I guess I'm hearing an echo from somewhere. I'm not yeah, sure just a reminder, um, while the speaker is presenting, keep your accounts on mute. Okay. Thank you, Mary, um, for, for that. Yeah. If anyone else has any questions, you can feel free to unmute yourself. I think it's a small enough group here that we won't all step on each other. Um, 
I know we have uh, at least one member of the audience that has gotten to go um, to Kenya to work with Action for Cheetahs in Kenya. Yeah, I don't want to call her out in case she doesn't want to say hi, but <laughs> um, very, very exciting um, work. I, again, like I said, I've been working for Mary for four years and I am blessed to have the opportunity to go visit the field sites in just two weeks. So very, very excited about that. Um, and if you guys are interested in volunteering or taking part in an organization like that, feel free to uh, send us a message. There's actually two people in the audience. One was a student with us um, who was a internship student and worked on a project with us that was our conflict mitigation toolbox. And the other one came on the adventure safari is similar to, um, to what, uh, what you're going to be doing next in, in about 10 days. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a couple people that have visited us in the past. Yeah, that's me. I went on the adventure safari. It's not a secret. I just changed my background. <laughs> you saw cheetahs. It was the best. It was really, it was awesome. We got to do some work on the ground and then we got to go on safaris and look at animals and it was fantastic. So I'm um, hoping to go, to go back and I know Jessica is going to have an incredible time when you go. Yeah, All right, we have I know I had a great time too, so it's great. <laughs> <laughs> Let's all go, everyone that's in here right now, next year, next fall. Karen also is, is someone who came to Kenya on the adventure safari. Um, I can't remember, Catherine, you were on a different group than Susan. You were on the no, second it was, group. So there's three no, it was the Susan, Jay, and I. Okay. Were the one, Susan, Jay, and I went together. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> so, it was five years ago in November. Wow, crazy. There's, a, there's another question. Um, Dominic asks how um, we encourage the local community to conserve cheetah when in the back of their mind, they knew it was preying on livestock. Um, interestingly enough, just very quickly, the, the cheetah, even though it preys on livestock, a lot of people that we interviewed said you know, we want to stop conflict. We don't want to kill cheetahs. We think the cheetahs are, um, you know, one of the animals that we know don't kill people. And, you know, what can we do? So um, in the areas where we've worked, um, convincing people wasn't the issue, but helping them to solve their human wildlife conflict. And, and we do focus on other predators other than cheetah. So the local community didn't want to, they, they don't really want to kill most of the predators. Um, they would like, in some cases, predators to be relocated, which causes its own sets of problems. Um, but, um, but the actual convincing, we didn't have to do that. Um, we just had to work with the communities to help them convince each other, I guess, is more what it was. Um, and then Jacob is asking about partnerships with Colorado State University. Um, yeah, I have a, a direct affiliation with Colorado State um, and, and one of the departments there that is the, the department that focuses, now for some reason I'm having a bit of a brain fart and I can't remember the whole name of that department, um, but it focuses on parks, recs, actually, Sonora, that's where you went, so you probably yeah. know it by heart too. It's um, yeah, the uh, Professional Science Masters in Zoo, Aquarium, and Animal Shelter Management. Um, and then uh, me working with Action for Cheetahs went sort of more of a conservation route. Um, there's a lot of different um, ways that you can go with that program. And I definitely really enjoyed going to Colorado State to do that. So I would recommend. <laughs> There was, there was another student from Colorado State that came from a different department that was focusing on community relationships and human wildlife conflict as well. So there's a, a big variety of programs at Colorado State that you could consider, Jacob. Um, so yeah, you can get in touch with Sonora, you can write back to me and I can connect you to Sonora's professor as well if you'd like to write to us too. Wonderful. Thank you so much. 
All right, so Nora, do you want to go ahead and um, put those slides back up? Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. So we'll have about um, six, seven minutes before we uh, start with our next presenter. So if you guys need to use the restroom, grab another drink, stand up and stretch, um, feel free to unmute yourself and have a little chat if you have any questions, have any questions for uh, the rest of us in here. Oh, we got one donation. Thank you to myself. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <Thanks> again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All righty. Again, here's an overview of what your $10 can do for Action for Cheetahs, what your $25 or your $50 donation can do. And if you want to donate a dollar, that's quite all right. Every dollar counts. Um, if you can't donate at this time and you want to wait till your next paycheck, by all means, um, you can take a photo of our Venmo or uh, save our um, save our account name. Or just by showing up today, you're you're supporting us. So thank you guys so much for being here. Just a quick question: What's included in the conflict? Ah, conflict mitigation toolbox. What do you guys use in those or is it kind of varies depending on what species you're targeting? Yeah, Mary, do you want to answer that? Yeah, so we used some resources from other countries from Namibia, South Africa, Tanzania. And actually that was Sonora's project as a student when she was here to meet with our staff and look at the tools that we were already using. And it's a kit on, first of all, how to investigate a livestock, how to identify the different predators in conflict, um, and then to actually figure out which predator causes the conflict and what mitigation um, activities can be done to try to prevent future conflicts. And through our research, we found that over 85% of, I don't, it just says my internet is unstable. I'm not sure if you guys can still hear me. Yeah, you can. Okay. I see heads nodding. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, the, the final part of the book is to just go through the simplest until more complicated ways. If something is already in place, what else can you add to help prevent conflict? And a part of our research has been to basically do interviews with people afterwards and to follow up with whether or not the conflict mitigation um, recommendations that our team have given to people actually have worked. Um, and, and I think I was saying this before it showed that I went unstable, that 85% of the people who we've consulted with do not have another conflict after that. Um, and, and so we wanted to be able to share that whole mitigation toolbox in something that was usable. And we've now conducted three workshops using the, the toolkit. And we have people from different organizations other than our own um, trying to use that toolkit box to make sure that what, they're, what we're putting in the box is, is impactful for not just ACK, but that we can share it across Kenya. Um, and so it was, it was adapted to be specifically for our predators here um, from other people's um, mitigation opportunities as well. I hope that okay. answers your question. Yeah, it does, thank you. What other predators do you have in your community areas? We have lion, leopard, spotted hyena, striped hyena, um, jackals, and then minimal but some conflicts with other small predators like caracal, serval, um, even, um, even, um, um, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on, on the little honey badgers and mongooses and things like that as well. So um, you're looking at which ones are the more serious conflicts and what you know simple modifications people can do to stop mongooses from killing chickens even. 
Um, so it's not just focused on cheetahs, it's focused on all the predators. Okay, thank you. Go ahead and move forward with your discussion. <laughs> Yep, here's that last slide showing you our Venmo. If you guys decide to uh, to donate today, we have uh, two more speakers tonight. One will go on in just a minute. So we'll give you guys another minute or so to uh, gather your drinks, your thoughts, what have you, and we'll move on. Um, Jess, do you want to go ahead and uh, take over and introduce our next speaker? Absolutely. So our next speaker is Andy Blue, and I will give you a little bit of a background on Andy. I have personally worked with Andy um, at two of his facilities and uh, funny enough we met in the Middle East where I was working and he had come over to um, help um, neighboring help to train, uh, learn to train some cheetah and um, ended up actually working with him at the safari park for a little while and then uh, followed him to the Humane Society because he is just an amazing human and a fantastic role model to everyone he meets. Um, so I had to keep following him because he's a very good leader. So uh, he worked for the San Diego Zoo for over 30 years um, based at the safari park. He was an animal keeper and then a care manager. And then when he retired, he was an associate curator of mammals. He was mainly responsible for animal shipments, exhibit designs, and animal welfare. He was also a member of the opening team for Disney's Animal Kingdom as a zoological manager. His work took him all over the world, including Africa, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, India, and South America. He's always been interested in approving animal welfare and wildlife trafficking, and most recently worked on projects in Somalia, Iraq, and Lebanon. He's been with the San Diego Humane Society for three years and is currently the campus director of Project Wildlife in Ramona. So welcome, Andy. We are very happy to have you. Please tell us all about what you do. Hi there. Thanks for the introduction. And, and I'm going to apologize up front. We have a little cattle dog puppy that's either running around with a sock or biting me in the ankle or chasing our cat. So. Uh, you may hear a little bit of commotion in the background, but it's fun. Um, so I don't even have, have to add much after Jess's introduction, but uh, I, can, I can talk a little bit about, and I, I know I've met most of y'all uh, in different, different areas that, that we've all worked in. Um, but uh, as she said, I, I started as a, as a keeper both back at the San Diego Zoo Safari Park um, many years ago, and then worked my way up to a lead keeper. And if you haven't been out there, it's, a, it's about a 2000 acre facility with mixed species exhibits and um, wonderful place. San Diego Zoo is a fantastic organization to work for. And yeah, for 34 years, I was there total. Um, worked my way up to animal care manager, then left, as we said, to work for Disney in Orlando and helped uh, build that park. We had a quarantine facility up in Gainesville and I managed that for a little while and animals were typically sent to that area prior to the park being open and everything from rhinos to tapers to birds were all housed up there. Um, but I was missing California and San Diego and then my, my boss reached out and offered an animal care position, animal care manager position um, back in San Diego at the Safari Park. So I took that and that was a great, a great uh, uh, position. And, and the San Diego Zoo and the Safari Park both ship about 200 animals a year uh, worldwide. So uh, many animals back to the Middle East. That's kind of what got my interest back in, uh, particularly in, in Oman with the Arabian Oryx. Um, so I did a lot of, a lot of that, brought rhinos to uh, Poland and Japan and quite a bit back and forth from India with uh, bringing new bloodlines back into the country. And, and what really got my interest in these animal transports was seeing these other zoos and spending time there and, and seeing the, the quality of some of these facilities. And, 
And for us to ship, let's say, a rhino to um, the Warsaw Zoo in Poland, prior to an animal going there, myself or one of the others would 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 fly over, look at the facility, interview the keepers, um, the veterinarians, really make sure that the animal's going to a good spot. And we did that with with any animal that was going to any any facility. So a lot of my role was was just that, checking out these facilities and then accompanying the shipment and then staying with the animal for sometimes up to three weeks, make sure it settled in and, and was was doing well. So, but you know, I started touring other zoos, like in India, for instance, I was bringing rhinos back and forth from the zoo in Delhi. And then I went in, uh, down to the state of Gujarat, which is where lions are, are seen. And they were having big problems with leopards. And so they were trapping leopards and just seeing the way some of these animals were being housed really kind of got to me. And so it, a big part of my role was also improving animal welfare in, in other facilities in those countries. So um, as you can imagine, um, areas like Iraq, for instance, Kurdistan, Northern Iraq, uh, there are two zoos there, and Jess, I don't know, did those photos ever make it make it in that I sent you today? Yeah, that's a, a good example yeah, of, uh, thanks, that's uh, that's an example of not an ideal setup for a leopard, as you can see. I'm not sure how it actually got on its side like that, and you might also notice the locks hanging there, and I actually had a broken leg when I was there from a motorcycle accident, so I couldn't run real fast, and I was worried that I was the slowest guy there when that leopard was able to if it got out of that enclosure. Um, but that was that's just an example of some of the, the housing standards that you see in some of these countries. And you know, not only is it, you can see the animals just terrified, there's all kinds of commotion around it and noise around it. And um, I think there were 18 leopards at this facility in similar cages. And, and these animals were actually caught because they were predating on, on goats and different animals. And so they, the belief was if they held them there for a couple of weeks sort of as punishment, then they would release them back and they wouldn't do it again. So, you know, you can imagine you're, you're trying to not only change the, the animal welfare while the animal's there, but also kind of change the, the thought process that, that that really doesn't work. Sorry, the dog's biting me. Um, so, uh, but you'll, you know, that's just an example. That's in India again. And uh, so you kind of see that again, that's what really got my attention was to, to try to improve some of these situations. And the San Diego Zoo was great about supporting these trips. And so after I would do a, a shipment, I would often travel around the country and, and just make connections and try to improve the, the animal welfare. And you may be familiar with Wildlife SOS. That's a group that we've worked with quite a bit in India. And they're the folks that hooked me up with this facility down in, in Gujarat. So um, getting back to my career from there, I went to, um, I became a, uh, associate curator of mammals and and that role was really primarily facility design and more animal shipments and facility design at the safari park so that was fun it was really interesting um again more more shipments and at that point we were working quite a bit in the middle east not only with with reintroductions but also we we do consulting santa gazoo does consulting as agreements with other facilities and there was a big one in abu dhabi that that i would go and spend either a month to three months to try to uh, improve the animal welfare and actually work with them to get them accredited to, to EASA standards. And so it's a lot of work, a lot of work to do, but wonderful, really, really fantastic people to work with. Uh, Jess worked with, with many of these, my colleagues over there, many from uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, um, Syria, these countries in the Middle East, just really, really warm, welcoming people. And that's that's what got my interest in the Middle East. And really any opportunity that I have to go back, I, I try to get in on it. So um, the next slide or the next photo, Jess, um, this just kind of gives an example. I'm not trying to show bad photos to uh, for whatever reason, but this just shows you an example. This is a, a zoo in Northern Iraq. And um, you can see the little tiger cub in there. There's quite a bit of wildlife trafficking through there that comes out of Syria. So there's, uh, you can just kind of see the head of the camel kind of wandering around on the left there, but uh, everything from pelicans in enclosures like this with really no access to water um, and just, just really pretty much deplorable conditions. So uh, 
again, there's two zoos in northern Iraq, and both of them uh, I spent time at and, and would just bring the most basic standards of, of shelter and water, um, whatever enrichment we can, we can get them to do. An animal like this, obviously, this is just a terrible location. And that, that facility was actually, I wouldn't say it was shut down, but, but the animals were removed from areas like this and moved to larger enclosures. And even though they were larger enclosures, oftentimes the, the public um, likes to throw the plastic water bottles and trash and different things. So that's a real, real hard thing to see day in and day out. And you kind of have to take the winds where you can get them. Um, and, and I learned that, you know, you're not going to stop having zoos in these countries, but you can improve the animal welfare in these areas. So it's hard to see. And it, and it, and it really is. It's not for everybody. But, you know, I always felt felt good leaving these areas because, you know, even if you could improve this one animal, this one uh, tiger cub, it was it was definitely a win. So um, interesting work. Uh, there's a group over there called the Kurdish Organization for Animal Rights Protection. And uh, I was actually planning on going back there this month, but uh, with COVID, it was, wasn't able to get in and out. So I'm looking at going back in March of, of next year and spending a couple of weeks over there with them again. And, and it's not only improving the animal welfare of the zoos, but quiet. There's also a lot of um, uh, displaced Iraqi and Syrian refugees that have left livestock. And that can be everything from dogs and goats to horses. So. Uh, the veterinarian that I work over, with over there, we can get down into some of these areas and work closely with vaccinating animals and dogs and cats primarily, but also uh, treating wounds on donkeys that are pulling carts and and even the most basic providing feed for them. He's a he's a wonderful human that goes down there by himself and does this. He's he's an Iraqi and. Uh, Good friend of mine and so yeah i look forward to going back over there and working with him and a lot of these you know they're they're uh again they were funded in the past by the zoo and now that i'm with the santa Humane society they've they've been supportive as far as allowing me time to go to some of these facilities and uh and pay my time so that's wonderful i think jess actually helped me when i went well yeah you certainly did when uh I was in Somaliland. <laughs> she hooked, hooked me up to get over there a year and a half or two years ago or so. And uh, many of the veterinarians in different parts of our organization from Santa Humane Society were uh, provided us with free medical uh, uh, medicine, syringes, things like that, and whatever it need, needed to be brought over there. Santa Humane Society was great in supporting. So from there, I, I moved on to the uh, Project Wildlife, which is my current role, and I'm the director for our, our campus up in Ramona. Um, Project Wildlife has two campuses. One is in San Diego at our main facility, and that animal that facility actually takes in up to thirteen thousand animals a year, and those are those are just animals that are indigenous to this area. So that's uh, the majority of, of uh, small mammals and birds go downtown, as we say. And then at the Ramona facility where I work, we have um, uh, bears that are displaced by the fires. Right now we've got six bear cubs up there that um, one came from the fires. We get these big Southern California fires. Um, we get mountain lions through that. We have a young mountain lion that came to us just a couple of days ago that was found in a backyard in Palm Springs that was in, in really, really, really poor condition. And so we work closely with California State Department of Fish and Wildlife, and they're they're often bringing us animals that are, again, that are that are in pretty bad shape from these sort of situations. But our uh, release rate is about forty percent, which is pretty good for, which is actually really good for a, um, a rehab facility. But that facility, as I said, in Ramona, we get uh, many bears, mountain lions. Uh, I think we have about fifty-one raccoon babies right now. Um, and then raptors, about 70% of our patients, as we call them, are all raptors. So lots of uh, red-tailed hawks, the local hawks that are in this area, as well as bald eagles and golden eagles and, and animals like that. And um, the team up there does a fantastic job. Many of them have been doing it for 20 years and they're, they're truly experts at what they do. So um, I think the next slide will show, or a picture will show a, uh, yeah, that's the last mountain lion cub that, that came to us. So that was a youngster that, uh, unfortunately, the mother was hit by a car up in Orange County. 
and she had two cubs and, and uh, the fish and wildlife folks were watching and noticed the cubs were starting to decline. They weren't old enough to be on their own. Uh, so they trapped both of them, brought them to us. One of them also had a broken leg, we came to find out. So that one required quite a bit more time and hands-on. And when we do that, they're really not eligible for release back into the wild. Um, so that animal went to a facility in Scottsdale, but this little one, um, uh, probably about seven months old at this point. And uh, that's a camera trap that was set up down the road. You can see she's got a collar on and um, she recovered and, and was reintroduced up here. Um, fairly close to actually where I live up in North County in San Diego. So uh, real success story for us and really proud again of the team up there. They do a fantastic job for us. So um, I see a question. Do you take intern students that work with your project? Are there vacancies with paid positions or all volunteer? Um, that's a great question. I can say right now our facility in Ramona is fully staffed. We do have volunteers that, that uh, just like it, volunteers in any other organization really can't, we couldn't operate without them to do everything from landscaping to helping us feed animals to laundry. Uh, and that's it throughout Senegal Humane Society, all of our, we have five campuses. So as far as Project Wildlife, we do take interns and uh, between both campuses, there's always opportunities to help. So, you know, I would recommend going on uh, sdhumane.org and that will show you all of the opportunities that we have throughout San Diego Humane. And, um, and again, it can be Project Wildlife as well as, as the domestic animals. And we do have a, a campus here that I was in, uh, um, the director of for two years. And that, that accommodates a lot of livestock, um, horses, animals like that, that, that come up into that area. But also we're really actively involved in what I was mentioning the fires earlier. When we have these big Southern California fires, uh, we have a facility that we can bring and relocate animals that are in areas that are threatened by the fires. So lots of horses will come to us, lots of livestock. And uh, yep, good question. We're in, in Southern California. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of my career in a nutshell. Any, any other questions? I have a question. Sure. Uh, <laughs> so I know that my biggest challenge in the Middle East personally was the fact that students are not taught that animals are sentient beings with feelings. Um, and therefore it was very difficult for people to relate to the pain or emotion that animals may feel and they saw them more as property. Um, what did you find was your biggest challenge as far as dealing with the culture differences between the Middle East um, and here in the U.S. and how did you work with that? I think it's just just what you said. I don't believe that they they look at that. It's more as a commodity, and um, you know the heat there. And I remember having a real struggle with trying to get more shade. Please trying to get more shade to uh, uh, some Barbary sheep. And uh, I had set up a contractor to come in and, and everything was good to go. And then literally the day of the work, uh, there was a decision made that we should make another popcorn wagon instead. So, um, you know, that's, that's exactly, I think what you're talking about. Um, what, I, what I saw, oh, can you see the puppy? Yeah. Um, what I saw was um, just the feeling that you could get another one. Like as you saw, probably Jess, we would get these cheetahs that were often smuggled and actually made it over there, but then were confiscated in one capacity or another. And uh, if the animal didn't survive, then literally we would be told, well, well, we'll just get another one. So I think that's the feeling, whether it was a giraffe or a cheetah or whatever else. So it, you know, it is, it is hard to see. And you saw some of those photos. Those are those are hard and we're all animal people and it's 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 really really challenging even for me and i've seen it for many many years and uh often in southeast asia i worked on the saola project over there and i would see in these markets a lot of these animals that were coming through and it it actually got harder to see than easier to see you know which i i would have thought you'd kind of get hardened to it maybe like a police officer or firefighter but for me it it, it it was worse as it, as time went on, you just took it a little bit more personal. 
And, uh, but, but again, for me also had to look at the wins and take the wins as they came along. Let me find my puppy here. I think she's got a shoe. Can you grab her? <laughs> Anza, come here. Anza, come here. Oh, hi. Okay. Are we good? <laughs> All right, go. Do something. Do something She's good. Okay. She's I, okay. Yeah, yeah it's not. Anza like the desert? What's that? Her name, Anza, like the desert? It is, yeah. Yeah. And she's not cuddly like you saw. It's not like a regular puppy that you can hold. If you hold her, she like bites your ear or something. And... <laughs> she needs some sheep to chase. <laughs> yeah. 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 Awesome. Thank you so, so much, Andy, for telling us about your your travels. Does anyone else have any questions for uh, for Andy? All right. Well, I look forward to. I, I heard earlier that in the chat that that some of you were you had uh, uh, kids that were interested in getting into the profession, and and it's it's a wonderful job. And I would have never thought when I started as a keeper that I would end up going all over the world. And and uh, it's it's truly the best part of to me. It's the best part of the job, and really really making a difference with some of these animals in captivity. What would be the advice that you would give someone that's trying to get where you are, or you know, it's um, a couple things. You know, I started in food service when I was 15 years old, and 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 it's hard because I remember I had applied for a job, and then they called me and said to come out, and I told all my friends that I, uh, you know, I really like animals. I'm gonna, they called me to be an animal keeper, and yet they gave me like a little paper hat and an apron and stuck me in a restaurant, and I thought this must be a mistake. But you know, you got to start somewhere, and and I learned that, and I did that for a couple of years, and then I, uh, and I think that's the thing is you have to, to really get your foot in the door, and if you can if you can do it, you know, most of these positions, at least in my experience, are offered in house first, and um, and and for me that that worked out while I was going to school, that that paid off. So I think eventually, um, I also learned that I never turned down a trip. So there were times where on a Wednesday they would say we need somebody to go to Abu Dhabi on Friday, and I'd say I'll go. And then you know it, eventually you just it became my my job. And uh, to me that again that's the best part of it. That's awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you all. Thank you, Andy. Oh, and I have been in Kenya. Someone asked if I've been to Kenya. I have a few times. Yes, it's a, it's a wonderful, beautiful country. Uh, wonderful people. And uh, I, I can't say enough about it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Do you guys have any other questions for Andy? You can either unmute yourself or write them in the chat. Um, we are going to break again for some social time. Again, if you want to unmute yourself or show your face, we would love to see it. Um, feel free to use this opportunity to go grab a drink, use the restroom, a snack, what have you. Um, and we will share our slides again. A um, little bit, uh, we have a couple extra slides for you that I I passed the last time, apologize about that. Also, Sonora, why don't you tell us a little bit about the cool crafts? Yeah. I can show off this one necklace that I've got. Thank you guys so much for your donations. We have $45. Good job. Thank you. So yes, one of the ways to donate is by supporting our cool crafts, which basically is our crafts from our artisans. So if you see the, the second column right there, handmade jewelry, there's also other items, um, but Sonora might be able to speak a little bit more on that. And then I believe Jess and Sonora, and then I believe Jess and Sonora 
both have some items to to show off. I personally have a ton of them, but I am on vacation right now away from my home. And unfortunately I did not bring any of them, so I cannot show them to you, but um, I almost have every single thing in the collection. Um, so Sonora, go ahead and or Jess, take it away. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> what Jessica had said, but um, yeah, CoolCast is sort of the program that um, Action for Cheetah uses to help work with artists in Kenya in the areas where they are doing their research. Um, so we work with a lot of different artists, artists who do bead work, artists who do um, different metal work. They um, work with a lot of recycled materials. So these are um, bracelets made from recycled, oh, I'm bad, at, let's see. <laughs> made from recycled Sofria pots. And so you can see they have like a cheetah face on them and like a running cheetah. And these are all um, made, you know, consciously with like wildlife in mind. And so we work with different artists to try and support, help them support wildlife um, and to give them opportunities to, um, support the wildlife in their areas by making jewelry that then, um, you know, sends this message that wildlife is important. Um, here's some other things. We have like little figurines, um, wine corks. And these are some of my favorite things, the earrings, wooden earrings. I haven't ever, I usually don't have my ears pierced, but I recently got them pierced. So I'm excited to be wearing these soon. <laughs> Those are some, uh, some of my favorites. And Jessica just had a princess necklace. It was also made by some of our artists. It looked like it was a blue one. Yeah, that's a really good way to to help support um, both, you know, wildlife conservation in Kenya and community groups because that's a really, really important part of wildlife conservation. Thank you, Sonora. Yeah, and as you can see in our slideshow, we also have some uh, 2022 calendars with amazing cheetah photos straight from Kenya. Um, those beaded dog collars are pretty amazing. Um, I keep trying to get one big enough for my waist <laughs> because I want to wear it as a belt. Um, but I have a couple friends that uh, picked that up at our last uh, virtual auction last year. And um, not sure if they're just gentle dogs, but those, those collars have held up really, really well. They're nice and durable and sturdy. Um, and then again, our virtual dog adoption. So any of these options goes to support Action for Cheetahs in a variety of ways. And you can see we have our link up there. It's a Shopify link. So um, go ahead and take a screenshot. Or if, if you're like me and you have your notepad right next to you, go ahead and jot that down and you can um, purchase crafts from our online shop. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID, we haven't had Mary back in the United States doing her, um, her US tour. But these are some items that we bring uh, throughout the United States to the various um, speaking opportunities we have. And they're a huge hit. And like I said, I think throughout the past four years that I've been working for Action for Cheetahs, I've bought almost everything on the table. Um, so really, really cool things. Beautiful beadwork. Um, I have I accidentally bought several of the same items. So I have a lot of duplicates, but that's okay. Cause they'll last for a very long time. Um, let's see. Ooh. Andy needs a dog collar. Yes, you do. Um, oh yes. Um, Susan said she really likes her belt buckle with the cheetah inlaid. I also have one and I love it. Um, really, really good quality items. So if you love cheetahs, if you want to support in a way that gets you something back, then um, buying some of our 
cool crafts or um, or other swag is a great option. That belt is really nice. I've seen you wear it. Yes. Yeah, she actually wears it to work. And um, if you know the life of a zookeeper, it's pretty rough. So it is a definitely a good belt. Yeah, it gets scratched up a bit, but I like have refinished it once. I need to refinish it again. Yeah. She's crafty. <laughs> All right, um, we have one more presentation of the evening. Um, so I'll send it back to Jess uh, to introduce our next guest. All right, so our next guest is Joe Taylor. And we are very, very thankful that Joe is joining us because like I said, it is early, early, early in the morning where she is and she had to wake up super early for this and we really appreciate her doing it. Um, Joe, I will give you a little bit of background on her. She is a conservation biologist living and working at the, please correct me if I pronounce this incorrectly, Karangani Game Reserve in Southern Mozambique. He grew up in America in the small town of Poolsville, Maryland, but always dreamed of working with carnivores somewhere in Africa. She attended West Virginia University, earning a bachelor's degree in wildlife and fisheries management with a minor in conservation ecology. During university, she worked as an intern for National Geographic's Big Cat Initiative and fell more in love with research and the work being done in the field on the front line. Her love of all things wild sent Joe on the animal caretaker career path where she worked as a big cat and lead ungulate keeper at the Pittsburgh Zoo and PPG Aquarium in Pennsylvania. She jumped at the opportunity when she was offered to move to Namibia to work for the Cheetah Conservation Fund as the assistant operations manager. From the moment she landed the very first time on African soil, she knew she had arrived exactly where her heart had always belonged. One year later, she was offered an incredible opportunity to advance her career by moving to South Africa to work for Panthera as a research technician for Panthera's leopard program, where she ran camera trap surveys focused on determining leopard densities and their distributions across South Africa. Her career as a large carnivore ecologist went a few cat sizes smaller when Joe started her master's dissertation in conservation biology, looking at the influence of camera trap deployment on serval density estimates throughout the University of Cape Town and Panthera Small Cats Action Fund. Since 2017, Joe has been involved in various conservation projects all over South Africa and has assisted in projects focused on wild dog, cheetah, and rhino conservation. In early 2020, she moved to Mozambique as she took up her current position of field ecology technician and digital media coordinator at Karangani Game Reserve, where she monitors endangered African wild dogs, assists with human wildlife conflict projects, as well as many other projects on the 150,000 hectare tract of protected wilderness. I will turn it over to Joe. Thank you so much for joining us. Awesome, thank you so much, Jess. Jeez, I don't even need to talk. You said everything right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're finally getting daylight, so hopefully you guys can see okay. Um, I am going to try to share my screen, so hopefully this works. I'll show you some photos, so that way you don't have to just sit and stare at my face the whole time. I like your face. <laughs> Let's see, how's that working? Can you see? Yes. Okay, awesome. Um, so basically, yeah, as Jess said, I started my career in the United States. I was born and raised in a small town called Poolsville, Maryland, and I saw there's a couple Poolsvillians on here. So hi, welcome. Um, I went to West Virginia University because they had a really good wildlife program, and I knew I had to do something in wildlife ever since I was a little kid. Um, you know how people always ask kids, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? Are you going to be an astronaut, you know, a chef, a firefighter? And I told my parents, I'm going to work with cats in Africa. Like, oh yeah, that's cute. Of course, of course you will. But I was determined and every chance I got, I sent mail to anyone. I would get a book from National Geographic, see a name in there, find out what their mailing address was, send them a letter, sometimes heard back, sometimes didn't. But I was just so determined that something somehow I was going to get there. Well, I did my um, undergraduate degree in conservation ecology. And then after university, I realized I need to pay the bills. I rented a place. I needed to eat food. I needed a job. 
And so far I wasn't having any luck finding a way into Africa. As Andy said, it is very hard to get your foot into the door in a lot of these careers. Um, so I put my wildlife love with my farm background together and I started becoming a zookeeper at a small local zoo and worked my way up to working at the Pittsburgh Zoo, which I absolutely fell in love with working as a zookeeper. Um, I initially at the Pittsburgh Zoo started with the big cats. I was working with their Amur tigers there as well as their cheetahs. They had lions, black rhino and randomly flamingos in the section I was in. And then I worked my way up to lead ungulate keeper where I was working with giraffes, zebra, dama gazelle and springbuck. During that time, we often had speakers coming over from different NGOs all over the world. But anytime we had an NGO come over from Africa, I was like, hi guys, I'm Joe. This is my CV, I wanna come work for you. And they're like, oh yeah, no, that's great. Um, we don't really have money to hire people, but no, that's, that's good, thanks. And I just kept doing it. Every time someone came, I'd get their contact and I would email them constantly. I think I harassed a couple people, but I would send them my CV. I would just keep in touch. Hey, what are you working on? How are things your side? And just kind of keep that communication open. And then one day, Dr. Lori Marker from Cheetah Conservation Fund in Namibia came and gave a presentation on the work that they're doing in Namibia. And I did the same thing. Hi, Joe, CV, I want to come work for you. And she was like, okay, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> that was kind of it. But a couple months later, I sent her an email going, hey, I don't know if you remember me, but Joe, CV. And she actually replied to me. I remember I sent that at my lunch break and she replied to me two hours later saying, oh, hey, actually um, we are hiring. Do you think you can have a Skype call in a couple of days? I was like, yeah, definitely. And for that one too, I had to wake up at two or three o'clock in the morning. And we had a Skype, Skype conversation and she said, well, I'm looking for an assistant operations manager. You have a science background plus a husbandry background. Are you interested? I was like, yeah, no, definitely. And she's like, great. Can you be in Namibia in three weeks? At this point, I had a really good position at the zoo. I was working on buying a house. I just redid my kitchen. I just bought a brand new truck and I'm like, okay, yeah, no, nope. throw all that away, sell it, get rid of it. I'm moving to Namibia in three weeks. And I did exactly that. That day, I put my two weeks notice in at the zoo, packed up everything, and I moved across the country to a continent I had never even stepped foot in, but I had always dreamt of. And as soon as I landed there, like Mary was saying, my heart just belonged there. I knew instantly it was where I was supposed to be. At CCF, um, I had a bunch of different hats that I wore there. One of my roles was actually doing a monitoring system with the black rhinos they have. And I would run camera trap surveys across their big field, their reserve area where their black rhinos were and identify each rhino, make sure that everything was going okay, just to make sure they're staying in the right areas where they were protected. And that actually got me really interested into camera trapping and a little bit more the field ecology side of things. So when I saw Panthera offering a position in South Africa doing camera trap surveys for leopards, I knew I had to try to apply. Um, through, like I said, harassing people, making connections. Back when I was in my undergrad, I was interning at National Geographic for their Big Cats project. And through that internship, I had met Luke Hunter, who was the CEO of Panthera at the time. And I had stayed in contact, harassing me, emailing, seeing how things were going with him. So when I was applying for this position in South Africa, I was like, hey, I, I emailed with this guy a couple of times and I met him at the Pittsburgh Zoo. I'm going to just send him an email. And I did. And that kind of helped get my name in there to actually get them to look at my CV when they probably had tons of applicants. So one of my big things I always like to tell people is if you're interested in this field, one, stick with it, but two, make those connections, network, and go ahead and harass people a little bit, email them. We are really busy. So if we don't reply right away, don't give up, keep trying because Really just getting your name out there, just showing people you're interested and you're passionate is what you really need to work on. Sorry, I'm not even doing photos. Um, but yeah, so I ended up getting the position and I started running camera trap surveys throughout South Africa. My job had me going from reserve to reserve. I typically lived in a reserve for about seven weeks at a time. And during that seven weeks, I would set up anywhere between 50 to 90 camera traps all across the reserve. And each week I'd have to go check each camera trap, 
change out batteries, download the photos from the SD cards, and then the fun task, which is actually really exciting, just a little tedious, um, would go through all the photos. And sometimes you would get over 300,000 photos from one survey site. And in areas that have tourism, a lot of those photos are cars and people, and also trees and leaves blowing in the wind. But as you're going through them, next thing you know, you have an incredible, awesome photo of a leopard taking down a Niala right in front of the camera trap. So it's kind of a exciting thing to go through your camera trap photos. Because like cheetahs and like our fingerprints, each leopard spot pattern is completely unique to the individual. So because of that, we can look at the camera trap photo and we can ID individuals. By ID individuals, we can actually get a general count for the area. And then using some fancy analysis, we can get a density estimate for the entire reserve and more or less get an idea of how many leopards are on that reserve or that area. And then from there, over time, running these surveys year after year, you can do a population trend analysis. So you can see, are the populations increasing, are the populations decreasing, what's going on here? And that really gives you an idea of what the carnivore guild or specifically the leopard guild is doing in that area. But as a byproduct from camera trapping, it's not just leopards that are getting photographed and it's not just cars and the trees, it's everything that walks in front of the camera trap. So this Panthera data is massive for many things other than just leopards. And with that, I started looking at the other animals we were getting on camera trap and we got lots of photos of servals. And I don't know if you know what a serval is, a lot of people don't. I think actually Americans might have a better idea just because they are common ambassador species in zoos. But servals are a small to medium sized cat. They're spotted like cheetahs and leopards. They're very lean, long legged and big, beautiful ears. They're stunning animals, but they're really elusive. They're mainly crepuscular and nocturnal. So they're awake in the dusk and evening or dusk and dawn and at night. And people just really don't see them on game drive. So there's not a ton of interest from the general donation community on servals. So we're not really funding the research for them. However, we are seeing serval skins in lieu of leopard skin in different traditional African cultures. We're starting to see servals pop up in the pet trade. And we don't know what serval populations are in the wild just because there has not been research on them and no one sees them too often in the wild. So I started looking into serval research, seeing what was going on. And there was only about 10 or 12 papers ever published since the 50s on servals. But all of the recent stuff on camera trapping with servals had been as bycatch. So it's been surveys set up for things like leopards, hyenas, lions, and not servals specifically. And I wasn't really sure because servals are so much smaller than these animals, if those camera trap surveys are accurately representing the servals. Um, so I decided to do an MSc through the University of Cape Town and funded by Panthera, looking at the Panthera data, but then taking it one step forward. I designed a serval specific survey. So basically the Panthera leopard survey, the cameras are about two to three kilometers apart from each other. What I did is I then placed cameras in between those camera trap stations to bring the camera trap distance much closer together and hopefully capture all the servals in the area. And then I ran that at the same time as a leopard survey was running. And through that, I was able to kind of compare the two, the leopard survey to the serval survey and see if the densities we were getting for serval were similar between the two surveys. And luckily they were because like I said, people aren't really putting the money into small cat funding. I think it's something like 0.32% of all big cat funding goes to small cats in the world. And that's really sad because there's a lot of small cats out there that are endangered. But it's wonderful to know that we can use the money for the big sexy cats, the leopards, the lions, and we can put that research into smaller cats like servals. Throughout my um, time with Panthera, I also got involved with some other organizations and other work, mainly just being at these reserves and being available to help. I did a lot of lion work. I got involved in black rhino work as well as white rhino work in South Africa. And then uh, one of the coolest things I did, hopefully I'm not running out of time. One of the coolest things I did um, was I helped repopulate cheetahs into Southern Malawi. Through the Endangered Wildlife Trust, I was working with um, Vincent van der Marva and I kind of helped on just um, 
friends and colleagues, I was available, had the time to help transport and move these cheetahs. We actually flew and drove around all over South Africa, collecting cheetahs from different reserves to ensure different genetics. And then we met up and this was all over one day. So it was four o'clock, three o'clock in the morning in one reserve and then driving six hours to another reserve then driving two hours to another one then flying across the country to another one all to collect all these cheetahs within a 24 hour period because they had to be transported to Malawi by plane and we wanted to keep them in cages for the least amount of time possible. So we did all that, moved all these cheetahs, flew them to Malawi and then a month later we had one more female to bring. So we actually drove her uh, mainly it's very expensive to fly cheetahs across the countries but um, we ended up driving her from South Africa through Mozambique into Malawi and brought her to Malawi as the last one to be reintroduced into this reserve and it was the first time they had cheetahs in this section of Malawi in over 90 years so it's absolutely incredible to be a part of that. There you go this is one of the cheetahs that we brought to Malawi here Jess I think this might be one of the photos you have. Um, is one of the photos so, yeah. I have on my wall. Okay. Um, so yeah, after that, I finished my MSc and I was planning on then taking a couple months off and just traveling. I did a lot of traveling through work, but I just wanted to travel a bit for my leisure, see a little bit more of the national parks and stuff around Africa and hopefully make it up to Kenya was my plan. Um, but I actually ended up getting a job offer before I started my traveling, which worked out because COVID also hit during this time. And the job offer was to move to a reserve and it's a fairly newly established reserve. It's less than 15 years old um, called Karangani Game Reserve. Now, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of Kruger National Park in South Africa. It's one of the larger, more well-known national parks in Africa. Well, Karangani is just on the other side of Kruger. We actually share a border with Kruger, but we're in Mozambique. And so I went to Karangani just to check the place out, see what I thought of it. Right as the time that lockdown, um, I don't know if you guys heard the lockdown. Or, right as the time as lockdown started in South Africa, where they closed all of their borders, they required everyone to stay in their houses. You only allowed out, I think like once a week to go grocery shopping and you had to have receipts to show that's what you were doing. Um, but I was in Karangani at the time for my interview meeting and ended up supposed to spend 10 days there, but spending seven months there before I was able to get back to South Africa again. So luckily I got the job and I wasn't traveling around Africa. At Karangani, um, like just said, I do field ecology technician. So I'm in the field when we have wild dogs with collars, I monitor, see what their movements are. We also have elephants, hyena, a couple other collared species that every day I'll check on our satellite um, collaring system to see where the animals are, what their movements are doing. Uh, monitoring in the field, we like to catch up with these animals just to make sure everything's going well and get an idea, especially pack dynamics, pride dynamics, kind of what's going on, impact um, elephants, a lot of you know are ecosystem engineers, so checking out what they're actually doing to the landscape. Because Karangani is fairly newly established, we're not like Kruger where we've been around for a very, very long time, but it's actually kind of in our favor that way. A lot of the reserves in Southern Africa have gone through uh, many challenges trying to figure out what the right way to conserve and protect and restore these landscapes are. And, through finding the right way, you also find a lot of the wrong ways. Well, we have the opportunity to learn from the mistakes of the past, but also learn from the successes of other reserves and kind of implement things and start out with this new track of land going the right direction. It's also a very large reserve where 150,000 hectares, which is 360,000 acres. So we do have quite a lot of land and they're doing a restoration process from community farmland, old civil war area, and then converting it back to what it used to be, restoring the land to its natural state. And through that, we're naturally encouraging the recruitment of wildlife populations coming in. We have elephants, kudu, lions are starting to show up, leopards, and that's all just natural reintroduction. Animals coming and saying, oh, wow, this habitat's safe. There's prey. There's what I need here. And so animals are naturally coming into the landscape. And then we are also augmenting a couple species, 
in 2019, we brought over 13 African wild dogs, which is my personal favorite animal. They're incredible things. If you've ever heard of an African wild dog, there's many different names, African um, painted wolf, painted dog, cape hunting dogs. Um, there's tons of different common names for them these days, but they're these absolutely gorgeous, um, colorful dogs with big, huge ears. They're very social. They live in really dynamic packs. And one of my favorite facts about them is a lot of carnivores that live in social situations, such as lions, um, wolves, you know, the survival of the fittest. When the lionesses work hard and make a kill, the big male lion comes and pushes them all aside and he gets his share first. But wild dogs are the opposite of that. They're so ingrained with their pack mentality that when wild dogs make a kill, the puppies, the oldest dogs, the sick, the injured, they get fed first. And then the other dogs do. If a wild dog breaks its leg and it can't hunt with the pack, the pack will leave that dog if they're at a den site, at a den site, or just leave it in an area. And they'll go feed and bring back food for that dog until it's better to help hunt with them again, which is really unique in the carnivore world. So they're amazing animals. And they also breed really well, which you would think is unexpected because they're the second most endangered carnivore in all of Africa. But if they breed so well, that doesn't make sense. The problem is wild dogs need lots of space. During a dispersal, wild dogs can move 450 kilometers. They typically will move 20 to 50 kilometers per day. So they need big open spaces. And unfortunately we're running out of big open spaces that are safe. And so that's why the wild dog populations, even though they hunt successfully, they breed well, they're actually severely persecuted by humans because they do hunt very well. Um, but also just not enough space. They're getting onto roadways while trying to find new land, getting hit by cars. So that's why it's really important to restore and save large tracts of land to get safe zones that we can have species such as wild dogs there. So I said, we brought 13 wild dogs in, in 2019. Our populations have bred, our packs have split. We've actually had another pack come over onto the property that we didn't introduce. So we have natural recruitment going on. And now this year we have 67 wild dogs on the property, which is an incredible win for wild dog conservation. And I'm sure I'm going over time, Jess. I'm almost done, I promise. Um, so uh, another project okay. I got to do. Okay, thanks. Another project I worked on this year was bringing carnivores to a game reserve in Malawi. Sounds familiar. Um, actually, ironically, it was the same reserve, Majeti Wildlife Reserve in Southern Malawi. And this time, instead of cheetahs, we brought wild dogs. So the first wild dog puppies that were born at Karangani were born in 2019, the year the dogs came. And at the same time, there was another park in Mozambique called Gorongosa National Park, which also was starting up a wild dog breeding, or not breeding program, but a wild dog conservation program. And they were successfully breeding in Gorongosa National Park. So what we did with the Endangered Wildlife Trust in African Parks is we did the first inter-Mozambique wild dog move and we moved wild dogs that were born at Gorongosa, three males, to Karangani. We put them in our predator holding boma with the idea that three females that were born at Karangani, we would introduce those to the males, form a new wild dog pack and then send that pack up to Malawi. And the initial plan was to keep these boys in the BOMA for about a month to two months. And then we were going to bring the females in. And then in the zoo system, we call it a howdy, where you have just a fence as a barrier. We we're going to have the males on one side, females on the other with the fence barrier so they could see each other, smell each other, get to know each other through the fence, and then slowly introduce them to each other physically to hopefully have the pack bonding process go as smoothly and naturally as possible. Well, to do that, we had to call the vets out to go find our pack of wild dogs and dart the female zoo watch. But about a couple of weeks before we were planning on doing that, the pack found the dogs in the boma. So being curious animals, they ran to the boma to check out the boys. I have some cool video I can find a way to share with you guys, or you can send me an email and I'll send it to you or find on my social medias. Um, the whole pack came to the fence line and they were chattering away to the males. The males were chattering away. And I was looking at this realizing, hey, those three females we wanna put in there, they're actually right here at the BOMA. Let's try something. So we locked the males in the back section of the BOMA and we just opened the BOMA gates up. 
And right away, three wild dogs are in right into the boma. I was like, yes, that was so easy. I can't believe that worked. Like how, how did that even happen? And then closed the boma gates, looked in the boma and realized it was two females I wanted. And then the beta female of the pack, which I didn't want. So it didn't quite work out that easily. Um, we actually used some bait and started just dragging it in and out of the boma and random dogs in the pack would run in, other ones would run out. And finally we got it to the three females we wanted were inside the boma, but also two dogs we didn't want were inside the boma. So we just closed up everything. And then going into the boma, there's a section where you drive into and you close the gates to make sure that nothing gets out. Well, we moved some bait into that area. And then I had our helicopter pilot on one gate and I was on the other gate. And we were just opening and closing the gates until finally the two dogs we didn't want were in that section. And I was able to open that back up and they were able to join their pack. And the three girls were left in the boma. So we didn't have to call the veterinarians. We didn't have to mobilize. It worked out really perfect, but it's kind of one of those ways that wildlife always finds a way to screw up your plans and it was really kind of a fun way to do it and very successful so the only interesting part was the wild dog pack then knew where those three females were so the whole time the females were in the boma the pack was right outside the boma hanging around they'd go hunt for a couple of days and come back but that led for some really incredible opportunities having the pack so close all the time I was able to spend almost every single day with them, watching their behavior, learning the individuals. And it was a great way to kind of learn the dynamics of what was going on. And we've seen some really interesting things from that pack that haven't been reported in wild dogs yet. Um, yeah, a couple other moves I've done. I've worked with spotted hyenas, helping to move them from another reserve from Southern Mozambique called Sabi Game Reserve into Zanov National Park. And we're building up their carnivore guild there. Mozambique um, had a hectic history with civil war and they're just kind of starting to get onto the conservation front. So a lot of reserves throughout Mozambique are more or less newly establishing themselves or really just starting to work on their restoration and their conservation. So you're gonna see some big things out of Mozambique. It's an incredible country, but we're building up our populations and we're having some really incredible, large safe spaces for wildlife. Um, this is a group we had. We had an incredible donor from America come out and sponsor collars. So instead of coming to Africa to do the whole safari thing, he decided he wanted to spend his money on helping conservation by donating collars. And these are our tracking collars we use. Um, you can see the large ones that are curled up. Those are elephant collars. There's also buffalo collars, a lion collar, and a wild dog collar that he donated for that. Um, this is one of the ways you can track the collars using VHF or different um, radio frequencies. So you have your little antenna there and you can put it on the frequency of the collar and it'll ping as you get closer to the collar. So you can locate where the animals are on foot as well as through satellite. Here is moving wild dogs. So this is part of our move on the big day going to Malawi. Uh, these are the Gorongoza boys when they first came in because another one of my roles is um, digital media. I run the social media accounts for Karangani. So a lot of times during these events, you'll see me taking scientific measurements while quickly throwing my measuring tape down, grabbing my camera, taking photos for the Instagram account. Here are the wild dogs on their day moving to Malawi. And then the, these are just some... To tell them apart. Oh, what was that? Is the spray paint to tell them apart. Uh, it was to mark which ones got darted in what order. So the vets knew um, dog number one got darted, let's say at 7.52 a.m. So he'll need to be topped up with medication at this time. Dog two got darted at that time. So just kind of remember which ones got darted and which medications they got. And then these are just some of my favorite photos I've taken. Just I think this is another one of yours that you have. I love this rider. She's so fat and just gorgeous. This is a boom slung, which is a venomous snake. This one actually was living in my garden. Gorgeous. Um, two bull elephants mock fighting in Medikwe Game Reserve in South Africa with a youngster watching. Uh, this is also a really cool photo. Of, sorry, it's maybe a little graphic, but wild dogs taking on a very large kudu. Again, with the pack mentality, these dogs are incredible. They're not very big. They're only about 25 kilograms. But because of their strength and numbers, they can take down extremely large prey, such as this male kudu. 
This is a lioness in Liwande National Park in Malawi. This is one of our dogs. And last but not least, ending on my favorite. This is, well, becoming a new favorite. This is one of the wild dogs from the main central pack that lives around my house in Mozambique. His name is Moringo, but I just call him Squints. As you can see, he has a little bit of a funky eye there. Um, he's had that since he was about four months old. Not really sure what the cause of it is, but he's doing really well despite it doesn't seem to affect him at all. And I think a lot of that is just the pack mentality. Um, okay, let's see if I can figure out how to go back to this. <laughs> nope. Ah, there we go. Yeah, so sorry, that was a lot longer than my allotted time, but that's what I do. That's where I'm from. And my biggest advice, like I said, kind of in the middle, is talk to people, get out there, network, meet people, keep those connections going. And that's kind of the best way to get into this field. And when you do get into it, if that's what you want to do, it's amazing field to be in. Yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to shout them out. Thank you so much, Joe. I, uh, I, I speak for all of us in saying that was highly entertaining and we all want your job. And <laughs> yes, I mean, I think I have a pretty amazing job, but I'm like, Anne, how do I get her job? Um, but you told me, so now I know. Um, all right, do we have any questions in the chat? Let me see. Um, I have one. Um, can we be friends? Because you are, you seem really cool. And <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I'm like, I just met you, but like, <laughs> this is crazy, but here's my number. <laughs> um, You'll just have to shoot her an email every couple of days like she did and then- Oh yeah, okay. You that. can't complain about that because you did it yourself. I'll just email you, send you a private <laughs> message every night. There um, you go. No, that's the way to do it. Amazing photos, by the way. Are you a Canon oh, shooter? You. Yes, yes, I use I Canon. I, I think I recognize that camera. I'm Nikon, <laughs> but we can still be friends. Um, ah, okay. That's why you recognize the superior quality of Canon. Oh, okay. <laughs> um let's see and her photos are amazing i have four yeah. of them on my wall you should all follow her social media at least just for the the great photos yes um i may do that yeah uh, jess was texting me photos that you took or or drawings that you drew during your talk <laughs> and i was like wow i have the the one of the cheetah face that you painted for oh, yeah, yeah. that's here on my wall and I it's hanging up in my right next to me I love it yeah and what I what I realized in 2009 when I went to South Africa for the first time is um a lot of game drivers are actually photographers because they have mm -hmm. ample opportunity to be in the most scenic, breathtaking environment. So why not capitalize on that? And we're stopped and the guests are taking photos anyways. So why not become a photographer and take photos yourself? And I didn't realize, but every single game driver that we had, had this massive camera and he's like, all right, you guys are taking pictures, so am I. And each camp that we stayed at um, sold books from their game driver photographers. It was amazing. Yeah, it's actually also really good for the guides that do photography because then they also know the ins and out of photography. They know what position you need to be in for the shot. Mm -hmm. So tourists that come over that want to do photos, they help line them up in the right area and can yeah. give them tips and stuff. Use that setting, don't use that. And this is about to happen, so get ready. Yeah. That's a it great actually point. helps their job to be mm -hmm. photographers as well. Yeah, I mean, if I take a bad job, I'm going to blame somebody else, right? <laughs> I'm like, this is a bad photo. It must not be me. <laughs> It must be something else. Um, well, I've definitely learned a lot in photography over the past 12 years. So hopefully when I go to Kenya um, next month, I will have better shots than my automatic setting um, 12 years ago. <laughs> All right. One, um, one question was yours, Jessica. How often are you hands-on with the animals in your position? Um really when they're immobilized. So never with wild animals, as cute as these things are, they're not something you can just walk up and touch. Um, so anytime they're immobilized, which usually the only time we immobilize 
is when we're doing these big moves to other reserves or when we're doing collaring, putting on these satellite collars, the vets come out, dart the animals, they go to sleep for usually about 40 minutes at a time. During that, we take measurements, we take biological samples, we do the collar or the move or anything else we need to do. And then we wake the animals up again. So that's the only time you can be hands-on with them. Dominic asks, um, what do you think can be done by everyone in conservation to save our wildlife? It's a very broad question. <laughs> <laughs> it is extremely broad, but I mean, the smallest things make a difference. And sometimes it feels super insignificant to, I don't know, turn the water off when you brush your teeth or turn a light off when you go out of the room. But if every single person in the world did that, it would make such a huge impact. So even if you're just one person, do the small things. Um, if you are a millionaire, donate money to conservation, please. Um, the head of Amazon was like, come on, give us some of that money. Don't go to space, <laughs> give us money. Like, let's work on this together. Uh, other things you can do, as mentioned, there's volunteer groups. A lot of these volunteer groups do charge money. It's pay to volunteer, but that money isn't just paying them so they can go live a life luxury. It's actually paying into the work they're doing, supporting their conservation effort, their research. Um, it's a great way to get involved. If you don't wanna travel, but you wanna do something on a smaller level, other donations, um, I'm currently looking for more wild dog collars. So if anyone wants to buy some wild dog collars, that's one way you can help. Definitely, I can show you what the movements are of them. Um, other things you can look at your local zoos. A lot of zoos, especially the accredited zoos, do participate a lot in conservation projects. So you can see what they're doing, what they need help with, support them. Or on a more local scale, get involved in your community, park cleanups, um, volunteering at parks, or just helping educate yourself and the people around you. So there's lots of ways we can conserve to all work together. Awesome, thank you so, so much. Uh, Joe, will you put a link in the Zoom chat of where people can go if they would like to uh, donate? Um, yeah, so probably the best way right now would be to get a, in contact with me. I'll type it just now. Typing and talking is difficult. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, get in contact with me. I'll put my contact information there and we can chat to see what you want to do, how you want to help and where we can go from there. Wonderful. Thank you so much for waking up very, very early. Um, I'm sure your call time is pretty early anyways as a biologist, but um, thank you again. We really do appreciate it. Um, if anyone wants to unmute themselves and ask any uh, questions face-to-face uh, -face with Joe, feel free. I know we have a, a lot of quiet attendees today, which is fine. <laughs> um, or we have the chat option if you'd rather write it in there. We appreciate Sonora and Andy and Joe having their cameras on. <laughs> Jess and I aren't the only Everyone one. Everyone has to look at the two Jessica's face. <laughs> um, Dominique has his hand up. Oh, um, perfect. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Dominique, did you have a question? Maybe it was an accidental hand raise. <laughs> it's easy to push a button on uh, Zoom. All right. Well, um, Again, thank you guys so much for uh, presenting all of our speakers this evening. Um, hopefully you got um, a little bit more insight on some of the positions in conservation and we will be having a lot more speakers in the future. So look out for that. Um, we have recorded this um, meeting. So uh, feel free to share it with your friends and family and um, donations are welcome at any time, even after we end this Zoom. <laughs> um, if you guys have any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat now. We'll go through the slides once more to give you an opportunity to see our Venmo. 
Yes, we'll post on Facebook and YouTube. So if you want to either rewatch any of these speakers or if you had friends and family members that were unable to attend because of time differences or working, um, please share with them afterwards. And here is our slideshow again. So what you can get. So I think our last, um, our last donation we saw was about $45. I'm not sure if we have an update on that one quite yet, but that almost gets us, you know, a day of national survey field work, a week of dog training or a week of camera trapping. So that's a lot, one whole week of work um, for our uh, donations tonight. All right. And like Joe said, we can, you know, get other animals besides cheetah in these camera trap photos and hmm. yeah when you can, yeah when you can serve one animal you're really conserving that ecosystem and and any animal that lives within it yeah i used to categorize camera trap photos quite a bit i mentioned it in the chat but on zooniverse.org um and i did a bunch with panthera i did a bunch for uh, San Diego Zoo, they've got several projects that you can work on um, just all around the world. So my favorites are the ones that have cats, of course, but it's so, so interesting to see all the different animals and sometimes humans and all sorts of, it's really, really interesting. And I learned more about the, the like smaller, uh, less um, flagship species that would be in each area. And it was really, really interesting. So um, and kind of addicting too. So if anyone has extra free time, that's a fun thing that you can do for conservation. Does your um, cat help you with that? I hear him in yeah. the back. Yeah, he's, sorry, he's a Bengal. He's really loud. <laughs> I have one of those too. I specifically left her in another room. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he, heard, he heard me talking and came over. Yeah. You cannot be on Zoom with a Bengal. It's just not possible. <laughs> you know, I have a black cat like that, but luckily I am not in the same state or the same city as him right now. So, or he was. Well, I'm there if you want to see him, but I'm also wearing my cheetah costume. If you want to see that, it's ridiculous. Oh. We definitely. Yes, please. Are you guys Everybody, ready? Okay. Um, go to speak yes, with please. you. Everyone, but uh, Susan, mute yourself uh, okay. so we can see this. All right, you ready? Brace yourselves. I'm turning on the video. Here I am. I can't see myself. <laughs> that is awesome. Yes. <laughs> Here we go. Here's the cat. Here he is. Here's me. Check this out. It has tail. It has. It has paws. There they are. Here they are. So, Where in the world did you acquire this? <laughs> Okay, you must put this in the link below. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I have enriched Jeff Bezos a little bit more. Um, and it is a uh, child's extra large. <laughs> so I was, I'm barely able to fit into it. Jess, you might you're be tall able to fit and you're into tall it a little too. bit better than me. Yes. But... If anyone has kids that like cheetahs, I will put the link in the chat. I have. All right, so if you're an extra large, only, should I get I a large or should I get an extra large? I don't, it has the um, dimensions in the, in the <laughs> product. So there it is. Wonderful. Way to wrap up this meeting. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but it's legit. Look, it's, it actually, it, it's not leopard spots. It's actually cheetah spots. It actually has like a nice tail. Look at the tail. Good. It Where actually has that? cheetah stripes and everything. So like it's pretty legit, I think. Oh yeah. It's only it's only like 40 bucks too. Oh yeah. Oh we we're all on the site right now. We're gonna um <laughs> we're gonna crash the site. <laughs> nice. I'm adding it to my Amazon wish list. No, That's not my wish list, my to buy now. <laughs> uh, I, I saw a question by Dominic. Can I can I interrupt the, the chat a minute and, oh, and answer Dominic's question? Um, <laughs> oh, I see it, yeah. 
And Dominic is asking, what is the future of wildlife as far as development is concerned? Are we going to put all our wildlife in zoos? And in addition to the wonderful costume, I think this is an, another, you know, good way to kind of make the, the ending of this of this meeting, because as much as the majority of the people who gave presentations in this section who are from America and got our start in zoos, I think we all agree that where we really would like animals to be is in the wild. Um, and if we could run ourselves out of a job, we would definitely do that if, if it were not for the fact that animals in the wild are threatened and endangered. Um, and, and therefore supporting research, um, supporting the local communities that live with and, and, and endure the elements of human wildlife conflict. But in addition, I think everything that Joe does and, and myself as well, also does look at what is happening with habitat degradation and, and land use change and the shrinking habitats that we have for wildlife. And when we give talks at facilities here in Kenya, we do often talk about the fact that if we don't conserve the wildlife that we have, that we live with now, in the future, you're gonna have to pay to see wildlife. And, and those people who, who live with wildlife, they think the wildlife is so abundant everywhere. And, and how do we get it across to those people, how lucky they are that they are some of the last few people that are seeing wildlife in the wild. Um, so Dominic, I think it's a really good question. I wish we had a, a good answer for you. And I do hope that the future of our wildlife is not to put it in zoos um, and that we can do the work that is being done by, um, by Joe and Andy and myself and, and all of our local and international partners that we have to try to ensure that that the wildlife stays in the wild um so that that is just kind of a, a very brief answer um research is important what zoos do in terms of disease and nutritional research that they do with the captive animals it's not just what they do to educate people and to get people to support conservation but it's also types of research that they can do in zoos that we can't do in the wild um, so there is roles for zoos, definitely, um, but every single one of us, you know, Jessica's excited about coming out in, in a few weeks to see these animals in the wild because she doesn't see these animals in the wild. Um, and, and it's a magical experience that I try on a regular basis with the community groups that we work with to tell them how lucky they are that they can see a wild dog, a cheetah, a leopard, and and what we really need to do is to reduce the human wildlife conflict and make sure there's space for all of us. Um, so that's, that's kind of my kind of segue to the end as well. And, and I hope that that website that produces those children's costumes can be encouraged to make adult size as well. <laughs> <laughs> all the adult size ones are uh, skin tight. Let's put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> they are not for Halloween is what you're trying to say. <laughs> well, they're for Halloween, but they're, uh, they're, uh, um, don't cover as much as the kid's costume does. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Well, oh thank God, you guys man. all so, so, so much for donating and for speaking and waking up early and staying up late and all the things. All right. Do we have a final uh, donation report for the event? give it 10 seconds. And if not, then uh, we'll be on our way. But um, thank you guys so much for coming. It's good to see everybody's faces. Um, check out uh, or, or follow us on Facebook and Instagram. We will be coming up with more of these events in the future. And you can hear from more people in the field or doing a variety of things um, conservation related, whether that be wildlife photography, 
or curators of zoos to see exactly what zoos do for conservation. But thank you guys so much. Please share this recording with your friends and family and continue to support wildlife in Kenya and throughout the world. Thank, thank you guys you so much. Cool crafts. Yes, cool crafts. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Hello. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Cheers. Girl. Thank you so much. Hello. Thank you.